Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father and Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text comes from our gospel lesson in its entirety, so let us read the entirety of it one more time. No, no that's too long. Uh, instead, we're just going to focus on the last bit of the last verse. Verse 25, the last half. But Pilate delivered Jesus over to their will. If we think about it, it seems like society is often defined by what sort of trials are going on at that moment. By trials, of course, we mean actual court case trials. O.J. Simpson, Timothy McVeigh, the Unabomber, Kobe Bryant, Scott Peterson, Michael Jackson, and then, of course, the daily ones, the People's Court, Judge Judy, Judge Mathis, pick your choice. And you can turn on and, and see even now documentaries about some of those cases that are longer ago. And as they tell them, of course, they'll talk about the facts of the case. But instead, those trials almost become more of a, a drama, don't they? It's like law and order in real life. Sure, we learn about the facts, and the facts truly are key. But even more than that, we hear about the emotions, the, the lawyer's strategies, the uh, witnesses' intentions, and what they really were trying to say. That really becomes the center of these trials. Impartial observations and statements of fact become so easily overruled by the drama itself and what that drama and emotion can begin to tell us. What sells now are the tears, the emotions, and that's what seems to drive the ratings whenever you're reporting on one of these trials. And so we move from facts to feelings. And now judge, the judge, or, or judge justice itself, is no longer blindfolded and impartial, but instead has the ratings in one hand and a TV camera in the other. And if that's what we're used to seeing in trials today, Luke's account in the gospel lesson read a moment ago, we would assume would be very different after all. Luke didn't have a TV camera in his hand when he was writing. Luke was not writing with a concern about the ratings because those did not exist. And as we look at the beginning of Luke's gospel, even way back in chapter 1, he talks about why he is writing what he is writing, even now in the verses, or chapters 22 and 23. Going back to the beginning, verse 3. It seemed good to me to have, uh, to have, to also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account to you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So, as we go through Luke, at least in the trial, we can expect less drama and no, and, and more facts. The courtroom drama that we're used to, in theory, you would expect to be no more. But that's not what we find, is it? In fact, Luke, as we heard a moment ago, tells us a lot of drama and shows us a lot of drama within tonight's story. The focus is often on the relationship between the judges. Did you catch that little line? You've got Pilate, who is of Roman authority, and you've got Herod, who is of local authority. And suddenly, in the midst of the trial of Jesus, the two of them become friends. There's drama and emotion that Luke is using to tell the story. And then he focuses in on the, the anger of the chief priests and the teachers of the law and how they are just shouting to crucify Jesus and proclaim him as the guilty one. And for us, just like today, the drama keeps us engaged. The drama is why we are still interested in this. And yet Luke has a different reason for including it. Maybe the best way to describe Luke's intention is like this. Have you ever looked out a window, and in that window instead you see your own reflection? It's almost like you look out the window to make sure the kids are okay in the backyard, and instead you end up seeing kind of a picture of yourself just because the way the light is working at that time. You look out the window, and yet you see yourself 
anxious, well-dressed, because there's a dinner meeting that you're preparing to go to. And as you look in that window and, and you see yourself, you, you see yourself not as the parent you want to be or that you're hoping to be. It's the third night in a row. You've had to go out. You haven't spent the time that you wish you could with the kids. And in fact, you really haven't seen them at all this week. The babysitter is just arriving and you're looking out the window to make sure the kids are okay. Now they're out there simply kicking the soccer ball around and having a good time. To them, everything's fine. But they don't know what's going on inside of you. They don't know that you are not all right. You look out, everything looks good. Or they look in, everything looks good. You look out, see your reflection, and it's just not what you want to see. And see, Luke's trial tonight is kind of like that window. We look into the trial, and yet what we are seeing in that trial is really a reflection of ourselves. See, we read about the trial of Jesus, and we would expect to find facts about Jesus and what he has done. But instead, what we find are facts about a fallen world and the corruption of sin that has entered into all of creation and into our lives as well. We would expect to see the truth that Jesus had claimed. And instead, we are asked to confess about the truth, or even the lack of truth, that is found within us as well. See, Pilate had no reason to crucify Jesus. In fact, he's asking the crowd that over and over, isn't he? Why are you wanting to crucify an innocent man? Why are you wanting to condemn him to death? And as they are shouting back, crucify him, crucify him, we see the, really the, one of the more powerful verses in all of this, as we read a moment ago. But Pilate delivered Jesus over to their will. And isn't that the key? Their will. That's the important fact. And yet that's what's so easily glimpsed, or so easily overlooked as we read tonight's text. Their will, those two words, is what gives us a glimpse into the fallen world in which Jesus came. And that, those two words, their will, is that window that reflects to us our reality as well. Have you ever found yourself wanting to do, willing to do one thing here in church, and then once you get home, doing something completely different. Your desire may be to tell your neighbor about the greatness of God's love, and instead you simply talk about the weather that is to come. You desire to live a different life. You, you will to live a different life. And then you begin acting like the old life, as that fallen creation and the corrupt nature of our sin continues to wreak havoc in our lives. It's almost as if Jesus is true when he was the one saying, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, Luke's trial, as he describes it, and as we look into that window, helps us to see the nature of sin. Luke's trial helps us to declare that sin is sin. And it shows us where our will leads as it encourages us to confess where we currently are as we look into that reflection in the window. See, it's easy. It's easy when we're in church to will for the peace of God to come amongst us and to will for the peace of God to reign in our community and in this world that surrounds us as well. But it's much harder to act upon that peace when we've been wronged when someone has done wrong to us. It's easy to want to help the poor, but then when we get home and, and see the advertisement about the new big screen TV, well, again, sometimes our will goes out the window. And so the more that we want to change, and the more that we wished we will change, the more we recognize the nature of sin, and that our desires are often fleeting and changing as the wind may blow. But see, tonight's trial isn't just about us looking in the window. 
Tonight's trial, it doesn't just show us the will of mankind and our will. Tonight's trial also shows us the will of the Father expressed, revealed to us in Jesus. For at the beginning of tonight's story, Luke tells us what happens to Jesus as he is blindfolded, as he is struck and beaten and and asked, uh, prophesy, which one of us struck you? And as he is blindfolded, and as he is asked to prophesy and mocked as a false prophet, the irony in it all is that they are completely fulfilling prophecy at that time. See, Jesus predicted his passion. And the scriptures told us about the one who would come who would be mocked. And Jesus comes and suffers death as part of the Father's will for his creation. As part of the Father's will for you. For God's desire is for all of creation to experience salvation, for all of creation to be saved. And Jesus comes to suffer in our place so that when our will does not align with God's will, Jesus says, I have completed God's will for you so that no longer is that the burden for you. So that as we used as part of the call to worship and the confession, that invitation and reminder that Jesus comes to give us rest from that burden. See, God's will shows us that love is stronger than death, that his word is more powerful than sin, that death is greater, or death is, uh, results in, brings uh, the forgiveness of sins for all. And every time we gather, That's why we do gather so frequent. Every time we gather, we are transformed by Jesus. As we are reminded of God's will, as we hear about it once again and what he has done for us. See, trials are around us everywhere. We can turn on the news now, and of course we're hearing about the uh, James uh, Worley trial up in Fulton County. And yet the greatest and and biggest, the, the most newsworthy of trials is the one that happened long ago. With Jesus in Jerusalem. And that trial is even going on now. See, even today, people are still making judgment about God and against God. Sometimes that judgment against Him receives national attention. Many times, it goes completely unnoticed. But you notice it. We notice it at the lunch table, at the office. In the first year of college, there is judgment that goes on against God as Jesus is now subjected to a new trial every time whenever we or others deny him as Lord. A great teacher, as a revolutionary, as a a prophet, as a figment of the church's imagination. Every single time, those are new verdicts being handed down upon Jesus that he is not who he says he is. God? There's no way. And yet that's who he is. God in the flesh, who has come to bring salvation, who hands down verdict after verdict against him. And Luke teaches us and invites us tonight to confess who Jesus is, that through his death and resurrection, he is the one who has provided the way, the only way to salvation for all of creation. And when our changing will begins to fight against God and go our own way, when our will leads us down the wrong path, God comes fighting for you. And he fights for your salvation to the cross. As Jesus goes to Jerusalem and among the nations, and as he comes here to St. Paul, and he goes throughout Napoleon and Henry County and beyond. And when we are stuck in our ever-changing will, when we see actions that may be offensive, or so we would assume to God, when we hear confessions that we deem to be rude, when we grow too tired of even trying, when we become angry at the words that are proclaimed and spoken, we put Jesus on trial. We declare it to be foolish, and sometimes even him to be foolish, because how can it be? And yet God still comes, and he seeks you out. For that is the will of God revealed to us in Jesus. And week after week, and tonight and every time we come into worship, we experience the wonder of God's love proclaimed for you. And so certain of our Savior and certain of that salvation, we go into the world 
into a world that waits in need of the Savior to come. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds together with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.